afternoon, everybody. All very welcome. Good to have such a crowd for an interesting topic. A little bit of housekeeping, I suppose. Mobile phones. Uh, maybe they turn them to airplane mode or turn them to silent, whatever is appropriate in the circumstances. Everybody knows that. And you know where the exits are just in case there's any issue. Well, we're I'm delighted to be here and to be asked on behalf of the Institute to chair this session um, where our colleagues here are going to, uh, which I'll introduce in a moment, are going to launch a paper in relation to the crime terror nexus. Um, this is a project involving King's College in London and Pantaray Research Limited. And the our two speakers are going to be Dr. Professor Dr. Peter Newman and Rajan Bajra. And what, what the project is about is presenting an overview of the links between crime and terrorism. A difficult subject uh, as a former police officer down through the years I would have known that that's a big challenge and a lot of commentators have different views on it. So I'm delighted to know that we have people who have done some research on it and open the debate, so to speak, in relation to it. It has always been a difficulty. Our first speaker will be on my right here, Dr. Peter Newman. Peter is a Professor of Security Studies at the Department of War Studies, King's College in London, and has directed the International Centre for the Study of Radicalisation since its foundation in early 2008. He has written a number of books, including Radicalised New Jihadists and the Threat Against the West, and he also has produced a number of policy reports in this particular area. He currently serves as the OSCE chairman, chairman special grant. Until the end of the year. It just no it's longer. gone, is yeah, it? It's gone. gone. Okay. okay. <laughs> this is obviously a, a slide without a date, but uh, we, we'll give you credit for it all, all the same. <laughs> and he was a senior consultant for the US mission to the United Nations during the process of crafting the UN uh, Security Council resolution on foreign terrorist fighters. Um, I have no doubt that, that Peter is eminently suited to speak to us on this topic, and he also studied in Northern Ireland uh, a number of years ago. Yes, our second speaker is Mr. Rajan Bazra, who is Head of Research on Terrorism for Pantaray Research Limited, which is a UK-based research organisation, and has specialised in counter-terrorism financing and links between terror and crime among European jihadists. He works closely with Professor Newman, and he has become one of Europe's leading experts on the crime terror nexus. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Peter to speak to us for 15 or 15 yeah, minutes or so. Yeah. We'll ask you to maybe use the podium if you want to do what you can do from here, if it, sure. if it suits you, whatever suits you. Uh, because we're switching okay, around. Okay, okay, that's okay. Yeah. Stay here. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak to you um, in Dublin. Um, as uh, my colleague has said, my name is Peter Newman, I'm director of ICSR, and Rajan and I uh, started looking at links between terrorism and crime uh, two years ago now. And we were first focusing on jihadists in Europe and then gradually also becoming interested in other kinds of links between terrorism and crime, looking at what came to be called the crime terror nexus. And we were lucky enough to receive a grant that allows us now to investigate these links in all 28 member states of the European Union. And this is the first of 15 reports that will be published over the course of this year, focusing on the UK and Ireland. And the three areas where we've been able to identify links between terrorism and crime are the following. The first, among paramilitary groups in Northern Ireland, which are deeply and remain deeply involved in organized crime in Northern Ireland, in the border area, and of course also in the Republic. Secondly, in British prisons, where we have seen evidence of criminal and terrorist linkages and connections and cross-fertilizing. And thirdly, amongst British jihadists, who before radicalizing used to be in many cases criminals and whose skills that they acquired as criminals may in some cases be used for terrorist purposes. And that brings me to one of the key points, why does it matter 
Why is it a problem when uh, criminals and terrorists link up? Why is it a problem when crime and terrorism cross fertilizers? Uh, very simply, uh, because it makes both of these problems worse, it allows both of these phenomena to become more entrenched, and in the case of uh, jihadists, for example, it makes it possible for terrorists to use and utilize criminal skills, more easily get hold of weapons, more easily fund themselves, and more easily acquire forged documents. And from a government and law enforcement perspective, it is a good thing to watch out for these links, to prevent them from emerging, and to counter them where they exist. And I do not want to bore you with a lot of theory and conceptual stuff, and Rajan will give you a baseline assessment of organized crime and terrorism in a second, but just for a second, let me tell you that there are, in the literature, three types of links between crime and terrorism that have been identified. One is if you want an institutional nexus, which is about formalized collaboration between organized crime groups and terrorist groups. This is about groups collaborating. A second version of the crime terror nexus is what we call an organization nexus, which talks about organizations where it's not entirely clear whether they are purely criminal or whether they also have a political agenda. In fact, in many of these cases, it can shift from one to the other. And the third nexus, if you want, the third type of nexus is of terrorist organizations who are recruiting from criminal milieus. This is particularly prominent in the case of ISIS recruitment in Europe. ISIS in Europe has attracted a lot of people with criminal pasts. In some European countries, a majority of the recruits that ended up joining ISIS used to be involved in petty crime or, in some cases, organized crime before. And in fact, if you look at these three types of crime terror nexus, we have found evidence of all three types across the islands of Ireland and Britain. Now over to Rajan for an overview of organized crime and terrorism in UK and Ireland. Brilliant. So just to give you a snapshot of the crime situation in UK and Ireland, the numbers vary quite a bit. So uh, the UK's NCA, they estimate there are around 6,000 organized crime groups operating in the UK with 40,000 individuals involved. Uh, here in Ireland, the statistics from the Garda are a little less uh, publicly available, but the last open source st statistic that was available is from a couple of years ago, which said that there was action against about 600 organized crime groups here in Ireland. Uh, but they didn't disclose the number of individuals involved. And when we look at the kind of activities, the behaviors, and the locations that they're involved in, we see, we see two things. The first is that they're really diverse. And I don't mean ethnically diverse. In fact, the majority of organized crime groups in the UK and Ireland are either Irish or British, although there are in some markets, so let's say in opium trafficking in the UK, it's dominated by Pakistani crime groups. Uh, famously, Albanian crime groups are, are muscling in on the cocaine trade in the UK as well. I mean diverse in terms of their organizational arrangements, right? So you still have these hierarchical, traditional, top-down, family-oriented crime groups, but you increasingly have more loose, networked crime groups as well, which afford more autonomy to their individual members. And so this is why you would see uh, crime groups cooperating with other crime groups, which you perhaps wouldn't have anticipated before. And as well as this, you even see criminals selling what is essentially their business to other criminals as well. So in the UK, we see this with the uh, drug supply lines, the county lines, as they're called, from London to the surrounding areas. They're also, di also diverse in terms of the activities they're involved in, right? So organized crime could be anything from uh, human trafficking for uh, labor or sexual exploitation to weapon smuggling to wholesale importation of drugs down to street level dealing to more traditional crime activities like uh, extortion or more novel innovations like cybercrime and new aspects of fraud. We also see that they're very responsive and they're responsive to law enforcement behavior. It's a very true cliche that it's a cat and mouse game. They're constantly uh, adapting and responding to how law enforcement cracks down on them. 
but they're also responsive to new market opportunities, right? They're essentially criminal entrepreneurs. If they see a gap in the market, they will look to fill that. And this is something that you could see in the pharmaceutical trade. So we spoke uh, with the UK's um, it's a Medicine and Health Products Regulatory Agency. It sounds very, very boring, but they do some pretty interesting work. And they've said in recent years there's been a significant rise in uh, the illegal importation of unlicensed pharmaceuticals uh, from countries such as India where they're produced en masse because it's just a low risk, high reward market. And if you look at it, it's really easy to see why, right? It's such a simple business operating model. Uh, it's not really a priority for law enforcement. And if you are arrested for this, it's unlikely to result in a custodial sentence, mostly just a fine. There's not really uh, violence involved in it. And so you can see why criminals would look to exploit this. So this is just a snapshot of the crime scene. If we look to the situation of terrorism, well, foremost on everyone's mind is, of course, the situation with uh, jihadism. And in the UK, the threat is perhaps as severe as it's been since 2001. And this is because the threat itself is so diverse. You're looking at uh, lone actor plots, uh, highly networked cells. You're looking at really rudimentary attacks with vehicle roundings, knife stabbings, to coordinated <coughs> bombings. You're looking at people that are born and raised in the UK, sort of homegrown jihadists as well as those that have traveled abroad, returned, or in contact uh, and directed from, uh, with people uh, overseas. Uh, it's also perhaps gone against some stereotypes about jihadism, so women are, uh, have recently become involved in some uh, uh, plots. And this is all reflected in the attack scene in the UK last year, uh, the number of plots and uh, the arrests that have also uh, seem to be ever increasing year on year. So, in Ireland, the situation is very different. I don't think the jihadist uh, threat is uh, anywhere near what it is like in, in the UK. It's, it's a very different uh, scenario. But where Ireland does obviously see the issue of terrorism is with paramilitaries. And just last month, uh, the British Security Service said that Northern Ireland is probably uh, the most concentrated area of terrorist activity in all of Europe. And you can see this with a steady drumbeat of uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, uh, so in the last five years, there have been uh, almost 350 shootings relating to Northern Ireland uh, terrorism, as well as over 250 uh, bombing incidents as well. And there's also a steady seizure of uh, explosives, of firearms, and of course, the number of people arrested. And it's widely understood that all groups, whether they've actively been involved in decommissioning efforts, maintain access to weapons or arsenal uh, of weapons as well. There's a, another terrorist situation which you see, and that's with the far right. And, of course, in recent years, there's been a resurgence of the general far right uh, across Europe, um, especially in the UK with street movements as well. And occasionally, from these, from these subcultures, lone actor terrorists emerge. So you could think of Tommy Mayer, who murdered uh, Joe Cox MP. But generally, and relative to the threat of jihadist and Northern Ireland-related terrorism, the threat of far-right terrorism is low. So that's a snapshot of the crime and terror situations in the UK and Ireland, and we can now discuss more where the actual nexus occurs. All right. Um, so Rajan and I will now briefly uh, touch upon the, the three areas where we've identified links. Uh, the first is uh, that I want to highlight is uh, on... British prisons in particular. Uh, prisons have always, of course, been places uh, that were significant in relation uh, to this particular phenomenon. That's because physically, um, this is where criminals and terrorists are in the closest proximity. It's because when people enter prison, they often ask themselves existential questions. They are open for new ideas and value systems. They experience a severe form of dislocation. They are cut off from their traditional social networks, from their families and friends. They sometimes, if the prison is bad, need protection. So prisons matter. They are places where people network. We know that in Britain, for example, the number of jihadist prisoners has uh, risen, almost trebled over the, fast, uh, over the past six or seven years. Um, this is a big issue in British prisons. Um, specifically related to jihadists. Muslims make up to uh, make up 15% uh, 
of prisoners in, uh, across the uh, UK. In some high security prisons, the number can go up to 20 to 25 percent. And the number of Muslim prisoners has been rising for all sorts of reasons uh, over the past 10 years. Very significantly, it's said to have doubled. And that's, of course, not a problem per se. Uh, religion, in fact, religious conversion can have a very positive influence um, on prisoners. But we're also seeing uh, the rise of so-called Muslim prison gangs, which are not terrorist groups. They're based on identity. Uh, they enforce strict rules. They are sometimes quite aggressive and coerce other prisoners, for example, to convert. Um, this is a problematic uh, phenomenon, partly also because Partly out of bravado, I guess, these prison gangs are glorifying terrorism. They often declare themselves to be supporters of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. It's not clear to what extent that actually uh, continues to be the case after people leave prison. But because the prison authorities in Britain have downplayed this phenomenon for such a long time and have been quite intransparent about the existence of it, we do not really have concrete figures as to whether these are anecdotal stories or whether they really systematically exist across the system. A second problematic aspect is, of course, the increasing number of convicted terrorists, which has risen sharply. And we are documenting in our report one case where convicted terrorists uh, actually started networking with each other in prison, construing a plot that was then attempted to have been carried out outside of prison after their release. And this happens not only in relation to jihadist terrorism, it also happens in relation, for example, to sectarian groups in Scotland and Northern Ireland. This is one particularly prominent example, Anton Duffy from Donegal, who lived in Scotland and uh, wanted to assassinate a couple of years ago two prominent loyalist leaders, including Johnny Adair. And whilst he was in prison, he recruited uh, a member of his group, and he also tried to acquire an AK-47 and a revolver from criminals who were part of the same prison. In other words, it would have been more difficult for him to conceive of his plan and to actually carry it out to some extent without his presence in prison. Prison, to some extent, facilitated. Uh, the plot, I know that very well because I served as an expert um, witness in the trial that finally got him convicted. And Anton Duffy was not a former member of uh, the uh, real IRA or the new IRA. He was a committed Irish Republican, but even these dissident groups consider him to be too crazy uh, to be part of their groups. And he wanted to carry out this attack on Johnny Adair in order to get himself noticed and get credibility with the leadership of these groups, so they would eventually take him in. He also started talking about starting a sectarian war in Northern Ireland. So he was clearly out there on the scale somewhere. Um, and uh, fortunately, it was not possible for him uh, to carry out his plot. At the same time, it has to be said that without prison, it would have been much more difficult uh, for him to get the connections and to make it happen. So we also see this nexus amongst uh, British jihadists, and this is even borne out by statistics. So a recent study of the, the UK's police national computer, which logs everyone's conviction, found that uh, almost half of British converts that travelled to Syria had convictions uh, on that system. And as early as 2012, SF15 were, were analysing their, their subjects of interest, their nominals, and they found that over 40% of those nominals had common convictions, right? So then they shifted their strategy to this so-called Al Capone approach. Yeah. If you can't convict them for their extremist-related activities, you would look to pick them up for pe petty fraud, some common crimes, even some drug dealing, whatever you could do to disrupt their activities as extremists or even just as common criminals as well. And what we find more generally is that often Jihadists, they emerge from these sort of subcultures where they're, they're fluent with criminal networks as well. And this is reflected in the propaganda that these groups produce. So you can consider this group, uh, they've got this fantastic logo, Riot of Tawhid. They were a British jihadist group that were active uh, in Syria. And they would, they would post so much propaganda online. 
back when it was much more accessible, they would post it on Twitter, on Instagram, they had a Facebook page and so on. And often their message was, was targeting those from a criminal background, right? So two of their posters, forgiven at the first drop of his blood, and sometimes people with the worst past create the best futures, heavily playing on this idea of redemption or purification for previous sins. And this has a wide appeal. You don't need to be a criminal to, to have this message resonate with you, but they often specifically spoke about criminals, so they posted videos where they talk about, okay, you know, you're a drug dealer in London, but why don't you actually come out here, prove that you're a real man, and fight your head. So they would also play on other themes of not just redemption, but power, status, and, and respect. But it's a key example of how these groups, they basically reflect the environments in which they emerge from. And you can see this, I mean, it varies pockets to pockets, clusters and individuals, but the case of the Woolwich Boys in London, you had over a dozen guys uh, all involved in street crime, petty crime, this is not organized or, uh, as we would understand it to be, who all traveled to Syria, and if they didn't die there, they returned and uh, were arrested. So this is something that we're seeing, but it's important to distinguish this from the organized crime aspect. This is not what we're seeing. This is much more low level. This is social interactions, people that have grown up in certain environments and are connected to this criminal uh, subculture, if you will. So finally, um, Northern Ireland, where we see the, arguably the densest and most institutionalized manifestation of this crime terror nexus in Europe. Um, many of the organization um, that, that still exist, whether dissident Irish Republicans or loyalists, uh, could be classified today as what scholars call hybrid criminal terrorist organization, which means that it's not clear anymore uh, whether uh, they are principally motivated by a political agenda or whether crime has become an end in itself. And in fact, in some cases, I would argue it is difficult for these organizations themselves to say um, on what side they are. Uh, paramilitary groups are a part of the criminal ecosystem across the island, um, but, and that's been true for many years, something that you know a lot more about than we do, but there are two aspects that I want to highlight because I think they are uh, relevant and have become even more relevant. The first issue is that of cross-border smuggling. Um, the fact that you have a border in Ireland, uh, two jurisdictions, um, creates opportunities for smuggling. That's been the case as long as the border has existed. And paramilitaries uh, are heavily involved, uh, have been heavily involved in decades. That is also nothing new, whether it is alcohol, pharmaceuticals, tobacco, other goods um, are being smuggled and profits are being made. Um, it is estimated that this creates a loss to the Irish economy of 2.5 billion euros every year. To some extent, it's a fact of life and there's only so much you can do about that. This has become more significant, uh, we believe, because of Brexit. If the UK leaves the European Union, um, if a regular, regulatory divergence becomes more severe, if that is going to increase, um, uh, that has the potential to increase incentives and therefore payoffs for organized crime. And it's really very simple. If you want, it's the golden law of smuggling. If you have a product on one side of the border that is more expensive, more available, or is available on one side of the border and not on the other side of the border, there will eventually be someone who turns that into a profit. The greater the divergence is, the greater the profits, payoffs, and incentives are. So if you have regulatory divergence in the case of pharmaceuticals, for example, because the UK leaves the European Medicines Agency, then I can guarantee you today that there will be an increase in smuggling, and this will benefit the main players in this game, which are, in the case of the Northern Irish border, dissident Irish Republican organizations. It's the most predictable thing that you can imagine. And the answer to that is perhaps to close the border. But that's, of course, not politically desirable. And as we know from our colleagues here in law enforcement and intelligence, 
it is also virtually impossible. So my personal view would be to stop Brexit. I don't know whether that is agreed in London, but uh, I do think that presents a problem and there is an organized crime aspect to that too, and that needs to be watched out for. The second aspect are loyalist groups inside of Northern Ireland. Um, and of course, um, this is also true for some smaller Republican groups like the INLA and perhaps even smaller ones. But especially the loyalist groups have been central players in the drug trade in the North. That is no secret and that's been going on for a long time. Um, there has been a process of that becoming almost institutionalized and entrenched. And it's difficult to fight these organizations precisely because they're not just purely organized crime organizations, but they also still, within smaller and smaller constituency, have a claim that is essentially political. They can still say in certain parts of West Belfast or East Belfast, ultimately, we are your insurance policy. We are defenders of the community. You may not like the fact that we're dealing in drugs, but if you're being attacked by Republicans, we will come and defend you. And that makes it difficult for these, for these groups to be eliminated because there is a small but still an existing level of community support for them. And this has become more problematic, I would argue, because some of these groups have also, while still being organized or involved in organized crime, has success, have successfully reinvented them, reinvented themselves as community groups, ex-prisoners groups, who, is, who effectively get subsidies from the Northern Ireland government. So you could actually argue that indirectly, the Northern Ireland government is funding some of these groups and some of these activities. And that is a deeply problematic aspect. I do think that a blind eye has been turned for some time for the sake of not wanting to rock the boat. But I think in the long term, these, the existence and the entrenchment of these actors in Northern Ireland is deeply problematic also to the peace process. So just to wrap up, we have a, a series of recommendations. And to start off, I suppose, with the, the most boring academic one, which would be effective monitoring. So this is to standardize the definitions used and to publicize them so they're accessible to all researchers. We also think that not just in UK and Ireland, but uh, all throughout Europe, radicalization really needs to be rethought. And these old stereotypes of a religious fundamentalist that would not engage in crime or behaviors that contradict this sort of puritanical religious image uh, just needs to be destroyed. Because many examples in Europe show that uh, jihadists have, uh, have engaged in crime, uh, they've also taken, consumed drugs, uh, which often goes against these sort of stereotypes. So we need to rethink what it means to be radicalized as well and understand that involvement in crime and criminal behavior uh, uh, is not mutually exclusive from involvement in extremism. We also think we should have safer prisons, although this is easier to do, easier to say uh, than do, I suppose, because in the UK especially, a, a program of austerity has drastically cut funding for the prison service. Uh, but this would involve uh, training all staff, making sure that they are well equipped and uh, not understaffed at all. Because we've generally found that prisons that are safer for criminals as a whole also do a better job against uh, extremist groups. We also think that all financial streams need to be counted. Uh, countering terrorist financing is often being characterized as going against big international bank transfers and so on. Whereas in reality, you're often looking at small-scale transactions, uh, and if it does involve crime, it's on a very small, petty level as well. We think that information should be shared, and this is not just internationally between different agencies. We're talking about within government. Uh, many examples uh, of recent terrorist attacks, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, it's easy to say, but often they could have been prevented or they could have been disrupted if different agencies within government had better shared information about the suspect. And we also think that, as Peter spoke about, we should avoid <coughs> regulatory divergence when it comes to issues of, uh, of Brexit. And relating to that, <coughs> to investigate the paramilitary uh, crime that takes place. Not systematic. 
in a much more systematic fashion. Uh, there was a great work of the Independent Monitoring Commission, and that ended uh, six years ago, and it would be great to see something like that uh, on a much more systematic uh, and continuing basis going forward. So the paper is available online at the moment, crimeterranexus.com, and we also have established a Twitter account, so please check that out at, at Crime uh, Terror. Thank you. Thank you.